Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 59, Psalm 59, Psalm 59, we have this Psalm in our Bibles because of a great spiritual trial in the life of King David, one that God was able to deliver him from, see him through. When Saul was king over Israel and the Philistines were at war with Israel, no man was able to go up against uh, the giant Goliath of Gath in the Philistine army. And um, according to the scriptures, he stood six cubits and a span, that's old English measurements, uh, roughly nine and a half feet tall. And word spread through the army of Israel that any man who would be able to defeat Goliath in combat would undoubtedly receive the hand of the king's daughter in marriage. His family would be free of taxation any further in Israel. And he'd be promoted to great honor. And, of course, the world knows the story of David and Goliath. We know that David was able to come and defeat the giant with, the, uh, five, with a stone and a sling, slingshot. And uh, don't you know that when David was put over training the, the army after that, he was put in charge of training soldiers after that in King Saul's army. Don't you know it would be very difficult for you to say, well, I, you know, I have a bad back or I, uh, I, you know, be a conscientious objector or say, well, I'm not very good at, hey, hey, he took down the giant with a slingshot. No excuse you have about not being able to um, fight in the army of Israel would be sufficient, especially when you're given a sword and a shield and a spear and a helmet to protect yourself with. It would be very difficult for you to beg off and say, I can't make it today because, you know, um, I have a sniffle. Or, I mean. <laughs> so it would be very difficult to get out of your duty as a soldier. But the king made David his own son-in-law, gave him his, the hand of his daughter Michael in marriage. It seemed to be a dream come true for David. And, and the people praised David after this incident. So much so that Saul became enraged with jealousy. And uh, they were singing folk songs about David. David uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And Saul was jealous. Um, even though David was the king's son-in-law now, it didn't keep Saul from wanting to destroy David. He wanted David dead. The Bible says, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance, Proverbs 6, verse 34. And in 1 Samuel 19, verse 11, we read, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him. They were surveilling his comings and goings, who it is that would go and visit David, and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. That'd be something to know that your father is out to kill your husband, that'd be a bad, bad position for any wife to be in. But, excuse me, and it was in those events that inspired this particular psalm. And, but it's not a psalm of gloom and doom and despair and woe is me, but actually one of a great uh, hope. Let's read Psalm 59. I'm going to read the entire psalm. Psalm 59, starting at the first verse, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity, and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me, and behold... Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen, 
Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee. For God is my defense. That is, the strength of his enemy would lead him to trust in God. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for cursing and lying which they speak, consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. and Let them know that God ruleth in Jacob under the ends of the earth. Selah. And at evening let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Under thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Stop right there. In verses 6 and 14, David describes his enemies as dogs. He says that go about the city. A pack of wild dogs. This isn't the only time David described his enemies or the enemies of God as wild animals. He described his enemies as lions wanting to devour him earlier in Psalm 57 verse 4. And as liars whose words are like the poison of a serpent in Psalm 58 verse 4. The prophet Ezekiel described the city of Jerusalem and its rebellion against God Quote, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey, that is, devouring them, robbing them, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. Ezekiel 22, verse 27. And Christ warned of false prophets. He said they were like wolves in sheep's clothing. Matthew 7, verse 15. And Paul saw them coming after he would die and be gone, he knew this was going to happen. Acts 20, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. It's generally believed that all dogs have descended from three kinds, from wolves, coyotes, and foxes. And through the, the intermixing or in, interbreeding, or crossbreeding, I should say, between these kinds, uh, they have produced all the other varieties of dogs we see in the world. From the biggest dog, the Irish wolfhound, bigger than a Great Dane, bigger than the St. Bernard's, down to the smallest, worthless dog, like a Chihuahua. <laughs> Why would Mexico be proud that this is our dog? That's got to be the most worthless thing. Or the little teacup poodles, you know, that the celebrities and the Hollywood stars carry in their pocket and their purse, the, the Paris Hilton little dogs. Red Skelton used to tell the joke about a man who walked into a restaurant and asked, who owns the big Great Dane tied up outside? One guy said, me. Well, my little chihuahua just killed your dog. What? Yeah, my chihuahua just killed your dog. How in the world could your dog kill my big dog? Well, my dog got caught, caught in your dog's throat. <laughs> That's a bad way to lose a dog, I'll tell you that much. And uh, no matter how much you might love dogs and how loyal they can be to you, we have a great little dog named Sydney. They can be very devoted to you and loyal to you. Uh, I was listening to George Putnam's radio show years ago, and some guy called, some, it's amazing the, the, the clever jokes that callers to radio shows think they're coming off with. But one guy said, you know, you take the word God and spell it backwards. It's dog, and isn't dog man's best friend? I mean, he, he had some crazy point he thought he was making. But um, no matter how 
much you love your... By the way, before I go any further, how many of you own a dog at home? One, two, three, four, five? Quite a few. And um, Dr. Ruckman used to talk about how dogs don't know what you're saying, but they hear the sound of your voice. You can say that dog, you know, you're a worthless piece of garbage, and we're tired of feeding you. And come over here and let me whip you. But the sound of your voice, they, they come right up to you, right? They, they hear the, the tenderness in your voice, but you're getting ready to get rid of them. But um, no matter how loyal they can be to people, they are still considered an unclean animal in the word of God. And we read, but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, Second Peter 2, verse 22. And um, people are likened to dogs and unclean animals in the scriptures. And the most cared for canine, the most pampered, we were watching something um, just recently about the, the national dog show, or what, what, the, what do you call that? The Westminster uh, uh, Dog Breeding Competition. And uh, it's amazing the, the extra care and peop that people put in to breeding purebreds of, of certain um, variety. But uh, no matter how much a dog is cared for out of the pampered pooch, no matter whatever you want to call it, that dog will still drink out of the toilet bowl and go sniff another dog's backside. Dogs are dogs. And uh, most people don't want to be called dogs. You know, guys have been calling ugly girls dogs for at least 50 years. Sorry about that, ladies. It's not fair. I mean, men are dogs, really. They can be crass and crude and uncouth and uncultured, no manners. <laughs> Paul warns about people who are like beasts. He says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Philippians 3, verse 2. The concision, that's an old uh, archaic word now, had to do with people, the Jews, um, demanding that Gentiles be circumcised before God would accept them. Paul said to watch out for that. And I call this sermon, Going to the Dogs. Going to the Dogs. And point number one is this, beware of dogs. As to be on the alert, be mindful of it, be aware that it's out there. When you see a sign on a fence that reads, beware of dog, then you've been warned. There's a guard, guard dog wandering those premises, and if he catches you intruding onto the property where you don't belong, then uh, you're to blame if he attacks you. And it might not be polite to say that uh, someone is like a snarling dog or a barking dog or an angry mutt or he's as mean as a junkyard dog. I was working in a, the funeral home in Pensacola when I was going to Bible school. School was at night and I had a job during the day. And uh, we had a guy come racing into our parking lot screeching the tires, and it was his brother who had just passed away. And then I was standing out in front of the building, and a guy standing there talking to me. He said, you know, that guy that just raced in, he's as mean as a junkyard dog. He said, I guess it takes all kinds to make the world go around. I'm glad I'm not one of them. I thought, wait a minute. Everybody's one of them. Everybody's some kind that makes the world go around. I guess I knew what he meant, but he, the way he said it, just I never have forgotten it. And no matter how you say it, and no matter how you want to approach it, people are going to dislike you if you're a true Christian, if you are trying to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to dislike you. They're going to find some way to make fun of you, to mock what you believe in, to belittle the Bible or to belittle... Some Christian, and I'll grant you, uh, Christians have given the world a lot of good ammunition to use against Christianity. I mean, you and I are living um, under the shadow of Jimmy Swagger and Jim Baker still to this day. 
Paul and Jan Crouch and all the other charlatans on Christian television. And just like our text today says, um, people go through the city looking for some way to belittle Christianity, to mock the gospel of Jesus Christ, to mock Christians, to mock the Lord Jesus himself if they can. So people don't hesitate to use God's name and Jesus Christ's name in vain as cuss words. And uh, if they know you are a professing believer and you have some kind of a testimony you've tried to put forth and, and to display, then they'll, they think it's fun to use four-letter words and vulgarities. It used to be years ago, if you were a faithful Christian in the workplace, at school, and someone would pop off with a dirty remark, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to say that in front of you. They, they know that it's offensive to the ears of a true believer. I have one friend who I see, you know, on and off through, through the course of my job. And if he lets some word slip, he'll apologize to me. I, I'm sorry, Mike. And yet, at my job, there are the ones who curse the most and the most crass and crude are the women. Four-letter words, expletives, I mean, I mean stuff that, that truck drivers and sailors and wouldn't use, with due respect to a truck driver in them. <laughs> but they wouldn't use it, and yet the women today do. At my job, the only ones who are covered with tattoos, who smoke and curse, are the women. It's a strange place. And as I say at the funeral home, people are dying to see me. But you need to beware of the dogs that are out there. A lot of dogs out there. A lot of people who profess to be your friend, but they're a dog. They may profess to be your fellow Christian, but they're dogs. They have your worst interests in mind. They want to do you harm, if, if they can be. Uh, just be sure that it's not because of something you've done to bring it upon yourself. The Bible says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. 1 Peter 2, 19. Jesus said in John 15, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. There in John 15, verses 18 to 20. Paul writes, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3, verses 12 and 13. The gospel of Jesus Christ, um, the re revelation of the scriptures, the testimony of a true believer, all stand in the way of people getting away with their sin. They... Today, today, in this day and age, to be tolerant means you let people sin right and left without criticizing it. That's supposed to be the, the right approach. Never raise an objection to somebody else's perversion. But um, my first point of this is this, however. Beware of dogs. There are a lot of dogs out there. And they mean to do you harm. But that leads me to the second point. Beware, but don't be afraid. Beware, but don't be afraid. The accusations uh, of the world against Christians, skeptics, atheists, carnal, liberal politicians, everything they, else they say, they can sound pretty frightening at times. And there's no denying that. The last thing on the mind of a politician these days is, what is God's interest in this national policy? What does God stand to gain or lose if we do this or if we do that? And I mean that either party. You turn on the Sunday morning uh, talk shows, the political roundtables, not a single one of those people is going to consider how does this square with what the scriptures say? Not one. But if you're right 
and you're right with God, don't be afraid. The Bible says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, verse 4. And we've all heard the story of, uh, or we've all seen it depicted, some guy who, you know, tosses a piece of raw meat over a fence to distract the guard dog. Well, he can go in as a robber or burglar and break into the place. And uh, so they may talk a big game. They may make loud, uh, bold threats. But they can be very easily distracted uh, onto something else. And they won't last forever. They might stand out there and yell at you when you're on the street corner preaching, some of you young people. But you come back week after week after week, but they don't come back week after week after week. They drive by and they see a bunch of Christians holding up scripture signs and some preaching on the, on the corner. And they like to make a lot of noise and honk their horn, try to drown you out or yell obscenities at you. I've been mooned on street corners before. And uh, thankfully, I'm not, I wasn't mooned week after week after week. <laughs> so people come by and they want to distract you and you sound like, man, they're going to really interrupt our work. The next time you go, they won't be there. They're inconsistent. So beware, but don't be afraid of them. Like, like John says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you have to be careful how you react to them many times. You know, seeking revenge or retaliation to some unsaved guy because of the crass, rude things he said, that's the wrong approach. It's the first instinct of the flesh, but it's the wrong approach. And you have to be very, very, very careful. The Bible says, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Romans 12, verse 17. Um, look at our text again. There are verses 1 and 2. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Deliver me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. Also verse 5. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Let, uh, be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. Boy, it's good to have friends in high places. It's good to know that, that you can call upon God uh, for help in time of need. Find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Uh, we read in the New Testament, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. So while you should be aware of the dogs, you shouldn't be afraid of them. And uh, who is he that will harm you if he be followers of that which is good? 1 Peter 3, 13 tells us. Just like dogs, people come in all types and varieties. Ever since the three sons of Noah came out of the ark, over time they intermarried and mixed with each other and produced all the other varieties of the uh, racial uh, features and characteristics that we see in the world today. Undoubtedly, that's where the variety in faces and skin complexions and height and weight and types of hair and so forth uh, Dr. Ruckman talked about the three main uh, hair follicles. There's the Japhethite, which is sort of a wavy. There's the Shemite follicle, which is fairly straight. And then the Hamitic follicle, which is uh, curly um, hair. I was thinking the other day, it's interesting that um, uh, black women like to straighten their hair to be like more like a a Caucasian or even uh, uh, Asian. And Asian women like to put a little wave in their hair like a Caucasian woman. And the white women, they want to curl their hair like the black women. And it's just this vicious cycle uh, of let's copy each other. And I know, it's, I, know it's, I know it's common for a lot of Korean, I don't know about the men, but at least the women to have a surgery to make their eyes open more 
uh, almond shape like a uh, Caucasian eye, right? Isn't that a popular cosmetic surgery in Korea? And uh, white women like to put a lot of eye makeup on their eyes to make them look more Asiatic. Being the eyelash makeup and and white women also want to get a dark tan, more like a Hamitic or you know at least a Hispanic uh, shade. It's funny how the different races copy each other, but um, that's just a passing observation on my own part. But there are city dogs and there are city people, and they go from place to place looking for trouble. On willing to eat out of a trash can if necessary, uh, no permanent home. And there are a lot of Christians, professing Christians, that can act that way. They uh, will go from church to church, starting trouble, spreading rumors and gossip. And when they've done enough damage, they're done at one church, they'll move on to another church and do the same thing. Uh, we've met people like that over the years. And Paul said, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Boy, don't we have them today. I mean, Joel Osteens and the Benny Hens and the, uh, everybody else in the world, they're nothing but dogs. And they're going about to harm uh, God's people who are trying to live right and do right, and follow the Lord Jesus and learn the scriptures. And Ezekiel talked about the princes of Jerusalem, uh, the ones who should have known the word of God, and taught it to the people. They were the most corrupt of all. And these fellows on television, you know, um, Jan Crouch, Paul Crouch, uh, Joyce Meyer, uh, Jesse Duplantis, and some of these people, they've all received uh, doctorate degrees from Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts University gives out, you know, a doctorate divinity degree like candy to any of these people who just get a big following on, on television and, and propagate charismatic doctrines. And uh, they say, well, they're doing a great work for the Lord. They're not doing anything for the Lord. They're doing it all for themselves. That's why you can find a whole host of videos uh, profiling the lifestyles of the rich and famous TV preachers. They live in these multi-million dollar mansions and multi-acre uh, estates. I was at... Uh, it was at um, um, I think it was Joyce Meyer lives in some uh, house with two or three guest houses on the property all around the swimming pool and the tennis courts and the helicopter landing pad and all of this. Kenneth Copeland said he wants to be the first billionaire for Jesus. He has his own private airstrip and jets of his ministry. And We expect unsaved people. We expect rich, unsaved people to do that because that's all they have. And when these people built God's people out of money, they abuse God's people, they teach false doctrines uh, to enrich themselves. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're dogs. They're the kind that, that will drink out of a toilet bowl if they think it'll benefit them in some way. They don't care who they, sh they, they, don't care who they have uh, fellowship with or who they associate with. That, I told somebody I was talking to recently, about Marilyn Hickey, not Marilyn Hickey, I'm sorry, forgive me, that Joyce Meyer, Joyce Meyer. She got this rough voice like Lucille Ball had after she smoked for 40 years, you know. And I was watching her, some TV interview at TBN, and Joyce Meyer's face all made up, and lipstick on her lips kind of curled up at both sides. She looked like the Joker from Batman, you know. Let's put a smile on that face. That's exactly what she looked like. She's scary. She is scary. But there are mad dogs and there are mad people. Mad dog's crazy. He might even be rabid. And he'll cause every other dog to go crazy too. That comes in contact with him. And some people will throw their poison around. They'll corrupt other people. I was listening to... Uh, Calvary Chapel's radio show in the afternoon called Pastor's Perspective, where they have different Calvary Chapel pastors sit in the studio and take phone calls on the air and answer people's questions. 
some guy calls up and says, yeah, I heard one of you guys saying that uh, in the Old Testament, people were saved uh, and went to heaven when they died. And if that's so, uh, well, what, was the, what was the need for Jesus Christ to come and die if man could get all the way to heaven uh, before the coming of Christ? And the guy in the studio say, well, I used to teach that there was a place called uh, Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort and help, but that simply, that simply means they were in the presence of God after they died. And people in the Old Testament were looking forward to the death of Christ, and they were saved on credit by anticipating that, and much as we're saved looking back at the death of Christ. And that's what this guy said on the radio. And uh, then the very next day, I happened to catch part of that program, and they had a different Calvary Chapel minister on the air, and someone asked a very similar question about how people were saved in the Old Testament, and this minister said, well, they went to a place called Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort, uh, then after the death and resurrection of Christ, he led those souls, uh, led captivity captive up to heaven, and that's why Paul could say he was caught up into paradise, 2 Corinthians 12, um, because it had now been transferred up above. So he was teaching just the opposite of the guy the day before him. The idea that you're saved on credit in anticipation of the, cru of the cross of Christ. Listen, when I was, I'm over 55 now. I know I don't look it, but when I was 45, I could anticipate that senior discount at McDonald's, right? But I wasn't going to get it until I qualified for it. You're not, the, the, the salvation by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ couldn't benefit anybody before it happened. That's got to be the most idiotic doctrine ever taught, and yet virtually all of them say that on the radio. The people were saved in the Old Testament looking forward to the cross of Christ. Well, good for them, but it didn't save them and get them to heaven. If they were obedient to the laws and commandments, it got them as far as Abraham's bosom. That's as far as it could get them. Because the animal sacrifices weren't sufficient to cover the sins of that man for eternity. But uh, they throw their poison around, they're mad dogs. And, uh, you know, there are little poodle dogs, little, they're poodle people, they're touchy and sensitive and they need special care and they can't handle any strong meat, they can't handle anything solid from the word of God, they want just the basics, just the, the light-hearted stuff and tell me a few jokes, uh, Pastor Joel, and uh, all kinds of nonsense like that. And if they hear something that offends their little sensibilities, they get upset and they uh, make an issue out of it, they go to another church if that's what happens. There are feisty dogs, and there are feisty people. And they're the ones that yak, 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 like the chihuahuas I was talking about earlier. earlier. And they annoy everybody with their incessant barking. There's always someone to, to complain about. They find something wrong, something that's not being done right, something that ought to be done over here, something ought to be done over there. They, but they themselves are doing nothing. They like to talk. They like to yak. They like to complain. They like to make a big issue, make a big controversy out of something that's not that important, it's irrelevant, and um, they're the kinds that, they're like a watchdog on the inside of the fence, when they see a stranger walk down the sidewalk, they'll bark, 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 you open that gate, let the dog out, no, 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 but run back to the porch, they run back to the porch where it's safe. So you need to beware, but don't be afraid. Dogs can't hurt you. Who is he that can harm you if he be followers of that which is good? My dad used to say, by the way, I was going to mention this earlier. So many people know my dad as Pastor Shrive, but when I was growing up, my dad worked for the Dog Pound, a local humane society. And the state humane officer, he managed the local humane society in this area. And he used to have this chart on the wall of all these different photos of all these different varieties of dog breeds. I don't know how many were on that poster. But my dad could just about look at a dog and he could tell you which breeds went into making that particular dog. Remember that, Dave? 
dad was, he was very sharp about that. And um, I think he was so sick of dogs after working with them all day long, we, we didn't really have one. We had a lot of cats, but we didn't have one. But anyway, they have a dog now, we have a dog now, and I, I love the dog we have, but point number three, not only beware of dogs and don't be afraid of them, but point number three, remember this. Eventually, bad dogs get put down. Bad dogs get put down. Put down is a euphemism, means to be destroyed, to be killed, to euthanized, um, put to sleep. That was another um, expression to describe uh, ending a dog's life. But look at verses 14, 15, and 16 again in our text. And at evening, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For that thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. These preachers might get mad at their people might be upset when their people rebel against them, and they might want to make uh, threats and ruin your life and intimidate you, don't be afraid of them. Eventually, the bad dogs, the poisonous dogs, the rabid dogs, the corrupt dog, they get put down because nobody wants them as a pet. And 1978, I was a senior in high school, and my dad was uh, still working for the Humane Society, and they had a, there was a lady down in Chino who had, I think, 75 dogs on her property. I don't know, 40, 50 cats, and the stench and the smell and the manure everywhere. Um, you know, you have these hazmat, fire department type people go there, and they're all gowned up and masked at the dog catchers. They're used to that smell. <laughs> so they went there, and... Um, found that the lady was wrapping up dead dogs when they, when they die and disposing of them, I don't know where, in the basement or somewhere in, their, in that property. And all the dogs that were still alive were riddled with mange and their fur and disease. They all had to be, nearly all of them had to be destroyed. They, were, they wouldn't recover from their condition. And... Dogs are, in a way, a great uh, a metaphor, a lesson on people. The Bible's unique in that way. It, it um, makes analogies between different animals and the qualities of animals with people. You and I are likened to sheep. You and I are to be likened to doves, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And the wicked are likened to lions to ravening wolves, to dogs, to serpents, unclean animals, to pigs. And, uh, and there's a lot of lessons you can learn from these different animals. They're likened to crows. Crows are meat eaters. Doves eat only grains and seeds. And uh, so there's a lot of lessons that can be drawn uh, about people just from watching the behavior of animals in the Word of God. But there were six reasons why David uh, had comfort after all of these things. His enemies after him, his father all after him, and uh, people wanting to destroy him, wanting to undermine him. And let me run through them real quickly, and they will be done. First of all, God was aware of his situation. There's nothing that escapes the notice of God. Uh, secondly, God knew the actions of his enemies, so nothing would surprise God. Thirdly, his own hand, David's own hands were clean of any sin. He had a clear conscience about how he had treated his father-in-law Saul uh, compared to the way Saul was treating him. Fourthly, uh, he knew that God still loved him. You know, when bad things happen to you, it doesn't mean God's not thinking about you. It might mean he is thinking about you. I know it didn't seem like that, but that was the case of Job. Fifth, he viewed God as his fortress, a place uh, of protection. He can get very discouraged 
with the problems of life, with the circumstances you're in, with the way others have treated you, the things people have said to you, the things some false pastor, some uh, false leader has corrupted you or tried to ruin your life. You can be very discouraged with that. But you can always trust God. You can always trust God and the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number six, uh, he knew that the end of his enemies would eventually come. Uh, like I say, the bad dogs eventually get put down because they're uh, no use to anyone. Uh, let me bring this to a conclusion. The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if he be followers of that which is good? First Peter 3, verses 12 and 13. So let me just conclude with this. Uh, the world and uh, many churches and some professing Christians are, live like dogs. But you don't have to. 